give a little bit of quick background here before I get into it. Um, we were running a low disturbance time system before we went into zero till. Um, so we were pretty well weren't a full tillage system. Um, we were trying to retain a lot of stubble prior to a disc. Um, so basically we went into our disc system in about 2007 um, purely to keep stubble. And since then I think we'll look at it now and probably go into it for a lot of different reasons for what we went into. So um, anyway, we had a pretty diverse rotation at the start. We always grew canola wheat, oats, barley, uh, lupins. We had a livestock enterprise as well, so there was always a loose and clover pasture there. Um, the livestock left the farm in about 2014, 2015 there, um, which was good. <laughs> I do, look, they're fine. Um, I do. Sheep and me just never got along, so um, that was the thing, but yeah, I fully enjoy people that have them and look, love looking at what they're doing, so it's really good. But so we're just a continuous cropping enterprise. Um, we have 1,800 hectares of crop. Um, we run a contracting business as well, so we do contract sowing, harvesting, spraying, um, filling my spare time that way. So. Um, what else we got? Um, while I was away from the farm, I left school pretty much and went working for eight years um, before I came home. It was a family business with Dad and his brother. So basically, when we got the opportunity to lease out the neighbours, there was enough country for me to come back and help out, and it was good, because I always had an interest to get back there one day. So um, that was probably... 20 odd years ago, so yeah. Right, oh. So, where we are is 35 k's north of Wagga in New South Wales. Um, up there, just on a closer map, is there, Wagga down the bottom, Mara just, just above me, uh, Coolman to the west. So, it's nice undulated country. Uh, just a quick photo there. So we don't have anything flat, so water runoff is a pretty big thing when you get a heavy storm. It does run to the bottom, and quite often you'd lose a lot of fences and all sorts of things that go with it. So, so we've pretty well been focused for a while on getting good soil structure, for inf good infiltration uh, to avoid all that runoff. And since we went into the disseeding system, all our dams have been dry. So. Once the livestock left, we pretty well pushed them all back in. So there was no need to have a dam there anymore and they are only growing a lot of weeds. So um, sort of got rid of them. Um, yeah, just a different photo there, a different aspect. So we run different elevations across our farm. We run from 350 metres back down to 250 metres, basically. So there's 100 metres of elevation across the farm. Uh, like David said yesterday, there's a lot of frost in the valleys. Um, our valleys are quite short, so we don't fence any of them off and try and do anything different. We just work with it and try and sow longer season varieties and a little bit better nutritional management to try and offset our frost risk. So, a uh, photo I took back in 2018 when we had Joel Williams over from a soil pit, uh, which is a bit of an indication of what our soils look like. Um, a little bit of a dark A horizon at the top, down to a, a red loam, loamy clay down to an orange clay, and then underneath that it gets very, very whitey, yellow, really coarse, sandy gravel. gravel. So um, I'd love to do another soil pit soon because I think a lot of that A horizon has changed a lot. Um, and to see how, how much it's changed further down the profile, which will be good. Uh, this is just uh, a few years ago we moved into some bioferts. I'll just put this video up here. A uh, little bit of what I've got going on in my shed. A little bit similar to Grant's, but a little bit different as well. Um, so, no, that's what we're doing now for a lot of our inputs. 
We've got an agitation in the bottom where we've just got a 50 mil inlet with a T piece squirting out to an inch and a half, fitting on the side just to give it a bit of agitation, which I think this video here will show just how well it agitates. If we can get that, if we can get that to play up the back. Yep. Yep. So at the moment I use these tanks because I've got nothing brewing in at the moment. They're just storage tanks for foliar fertilisers at the moment. We're just mixing into that just to take straight out to the spray cart. So, um, so yeah, we get a fair bit of agitation through that system inside the tank, as you can see there. Oh. Um, there's my vibrating screen. There's a filter. It all gets run through that. It goes to a storage tank out the back that we've got set up. Um, pretty similar to Grant's, actually. Um, sewing, this is our air seeder setup. We run an Excel single disc seeder. Uh, it's a high lift frame. Um, we've just got a small air cart at the back, just a two bin. And we've got our liquid trailer at the back set up. We made ourselves a few years ago. Um, it's a bit of a close up of the unit. We've got the hydraulic ram on there. We've got a Needham seed firming wheel, the green wheel for flexibility, which works very well. Um, another angle there, we've got the spoke closer, narrow gauge wheels. We're also running a stainless steel diffuser, um, just a long jeopardy and wear. We found with a lot of, lot of granules, especially the humate granules were fairly coarse and they were actually chopping the plastic ones out. So we went to the stainless steel ones, so they lasted a lot longer. Um, liquid systems for liquid inject, we've got there coming down, we run it down the air hose from the heads. Um, bit of a photo there where I've put my liquid tube, I've stitched it onto the back of the seed tube inside the boot. Um, purely I wanted to get my liquid stream in the ground close to the seed, so um, plus it wasn't going to get damaged in there either. Um, with a lot of our country, there's a lot of rock. So I do see it moving around the boot when we're sowing and coming in there and smacking the back of the seed boot. So in there, I knew it was going to be safe and nothing get damaged. A uh, little photo from underneath. So that was halfway through sowing. So no, we, every now and then we may get a little bit of a block up issue. Um, if we get a heap of powder in one, one load of fertiliser, it'll play a little bit of havoc there, but generally most of the time it's been pretty good. Yep. Um, fertilisers, uh, where are we? I'm mixing up, mixing up all my own fertiliser there, it's all my companion mix. I've got some vetch, humates, uh, guano granules, all pre-mixed to go out, just purely because I've only got two bins in my air cart. So I've got to pre-batch it all before I take it out to the paddock to make life easier. Um, it'd be a lot easier if I had another bin, bin or two to meter it separately, but we just don't have that. So that's how I make that work. It um, works all right. Might run a bit funny every now and then. You might get a patch in a paddock where there's a concentration of etch or whether it's beans I've mixed in for the beans. Um, but generally they're pretty good to run like that. Um, seed treatments, we're running all biological treatments on our seed. It's, um, it's a photo of some beans. It's just got a few, bit of micronized guano, some kelp. Um, what else we got on there? Um, some biological products, a lot of different species. And that's just put on up the auger as it goes into the truck from the shed. It's just mixed in the bucket and tipped in the bottom of the auger at a at a rate I know that seems to coat the seed. So, that one's that. Uh, ground cover, we run uh, a stripper front. That's just a photo after a summer storm and after 40 mils of rain, yeah, we had the probe go straight in. So we, not getting any of that runoff. And basically I know if it rains in January, I can hold that moisture there through till March and sow all my crops on time. It's, it's 
it's locked away, it's not evaporating, the wind doesn't get at it and draw it out of the paddock. It's pretty good. I'm really happy with the system. Sowing depths, I'm very aggressive with my canola sowing depths at the start of April, the end of March. I will sow it 50 mil deep, but I do find that's quite a stable area in our soil with moisture, soil temperature, and I just know it works. Over a few years, we've tried sowing shallow, bought a disc seeder, thought, yep, it'll be great to sow canola nice and shallow, half an inch, but it just didn't work. It dried out far too quick. So went down a couple of notches deeper and it just, just works so well. So we've always found that with the setup we've got on the seeder now, we're always, might be cutting in deep, but we're actually leaving sort of 20 mils of dirt just above the seed. So it's in a little bit of a groove and the canola comes through it quite well, very quick, but it's always in the moisture. So uh, just some canola and vetch emerging through some stubble. Um, it just works. I love sowing canola in stubbles. A lot of people tell me they can never ever make it work. Um, I don't actually know what the go is, but I just know it works at my place and I really enjoy it. I sort of believe with some of the insect pressures that people have, I think it's the stripper front makes the big difference with us. We're not leaving a lot of chaff behind, so we're not creating an environment for the slugs and those sorts of things to live in. They are there, but they just don't seem to thrive and knock the crop around. This year, the only spot I've got where I've had issues with slugs has been where we've had a spread a problem with the bean residue this year, where we've gone in with canola behind beans, and the beans never ground up this year, and they came out in big clumps out the back of the header. So those clumps harboured all our slugs when we went back and had a good look, and that they just took off from there. So it's the first year this year that I actually had an issue in just a couple of paddocks up one end for a very long time around slugs, and they've always been there. So um, the canola took that photo a while ago. It's out of the same paddock, it's in the same row, it's only a couple of inches apart, sowed all the same depth. It was just probably about a day's difference in emergence. It's just the one on the left came through a bit more straw than the one on the right. And it had the same energy, everything else. You can see by the first leaf that it's not actually that far behind, even though it's had to work through all that stubble. So I just really like that. Yeah. Uh, here's a, f this one a video. Uh, can we get that one to play? This is a video of sowing in. May not be all that clear, but when I sow into the stubbles, I like to leave my straw standing as best I can. Um, off to the right, it's been sowed already, so I've got about a third standing, a third on the ground, and a third sort of at 45. It's just a rough observation that. So, but for some reason, I believe with nutrient uptake and, and, and efficiencies, because I haven't got all that straw lying on the ground, feeding the bugs straight away in the winter, it's giving me a little bit more nitrogen there for the crop to get growing through the winter time. It's not all being consumed by the bugs. So it, that straw, as the crop comes up and grows, it seems to pull the straw down with it, so it's slowly feeding the bugs up way and keeping things covered. Um, I'm just not putting it all down at once and tying it all up at the start. Uh, this one is another, another little video here, if we can get it to play. It's a, it's a little slow motion video of just how the units are running through the straw. Um, most of the time my units are dull, they're not sharp, as we have a lot of rock on our risers. Um, we do have quartz rises and we have a lot of shale on a few blocks as well, so our discs stay dull. I um, hope everyone can sort of see that. But um, it sort of, we cut a fair bit of the straw but it also divides the straw a little bit if it's viewed. But um, So we're not actually, it's sort of, it's basically 
dividing the straw, cutting a little bit, but because we're on a real aggressive depth setting, it actually seems to not hairpin anywhere. So we get really good establishments. Um, the, I'll just wait for that one to finish. Drags on a bit. There, I set the cedar to inner row sail as well. Like it's on, we're on eight inches. So on 200 mils, it seems to sit in the middle quite well and it just works. I'll go past that one. It's just different angle running through a bit of the straw. So there is quite a volume of stubble there. Um, so that's establishing canola, wheat or barley in all those stubbles, it's all much the same. Afterwards, it still cuts. The, there's a couple of rows there you'll see where it's cut the straw. Um, I like that Excel unit because it is a low disturbance unit. I, um, I don't want to see a lot of disturbance in my system. And that's why when I run through it, it's very hard to find where it's been. There's just no soil thrown over the straw to assist it breaking down. Um, it just breaks down itself slowly. So, uh, that video before was sowing barley and that's just how that barley crop looks at the moment. So it hasn't held it back at all. It's um, no issues, no gaps. It's established quite well. Uh, when it's set up properly, it'll cut quite comfortably through polypipe. So <laughs> it's not ideal when I go contracting and they've got a polypipe running along the ground somewhere and yeah, they'll run water to a trough. But anyway, it's, it does its job and that's why I love the hydraulic downforce. It's got that unit always engaged on the ground and it's always cutting. Um, biology. Uh, moved into a lot more biological focus a few years ago and with a lot of stimulants and biology going down our liquid inject, we're putting a lot of different organisms down, a lot of food sources, a lot of fish, a lot of kelp, uh, a lot of carbon. We're using fulvic in our row. Um, we've sort of found that the humix weren't compatible with our acidic liquids, so we've gone to the fulvic for that reason. And we're finding we're getting a very good early vigour with our seedlings. So as soon as they germinate, they take off and they're punching out a lot of roots really quickly. So really happy with the rhizo sheaths we're getting. Uh, just a few more pictures of them, just different sprouts, different sort of root lengths. Um, and as, yeah, different crops, it's just one of those things you just I like digging around as they're coming up and just seeing what's happening. Uh, our biology we're starting to find now colonising a lot of our seed, a lot of our root systems early on, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, a lot of early disease we're not seeing as much as we probably do see in the neighbours, but at the moment I'm very comfortable how all that's going. Someone smarter than me may one day tell me that's wrong, I should be doing it differently. But at the moment, I think that's working and I think that's positive. I don't actually know what each individual colour or species is, but to me there's a lot of different species going on there, so it's bound to be one of them. Um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> millipedes, millipedes and earwigs. Um, a lot of people have said lately they've had a influx of millipedes in their retained systems with the disc seeders and the stripper fronts. A few years back we had a lot of millipedes but they didn't seem to affect the crop and for that reason I think it was because we still had a lot of, a lot of stubble residue on the surface which they seemed to like in eating and I've always found that they seem to burrow into the ground to live so to me they're actually just churning it up, pulling it all down, getting it to cycle, feeding other organisms with it. But um, I've never had a negative effect by them. The one year that they were really bad, we let them be, and the next year they just balanced out, they disappeared. So I should have probably added a bit earlier that we dropped insecticides back about 
2016. So um, things have balanced up pretty much since then, I believe, and everything's got its place and it's got its numbers balanced. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just another photo of a different depth where I dug them up from. It was about an inch to two inches deep. So they do like burrowing in. So worms, um, they're great too. They seem to pull a lot of residue down, pull a lot of soil up and down their worm channels, um, as well as a good indicator of a good healthy soil. Um, quite often digging them up all the time, so I'm pretty happy that's telling me that everything's working well. A yep. uh, photo there I found the other day where it's a bit of red soil there in a worm channel that's come down from depth, and he's brought it up to the surface, and I couldn't find any the other day. I spent a good a couple of hours trying to digging around, trying to find one that was the other way where it was a lot of dark soil went down, but I just ran out of time. I, uh, I learned a lesson the other day about backing up all my phones and photos on a hard drive. Apparently I can't open that hard drive anymore, so, um, yeah. So, anyway, so we've dug that one up and I thought it was just a good example how well the worms are cycling a lot of our stuff and bringing things up and down. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more fungal activity as the crops are growing in our soils and which has come right back in and just everything's coming to life and I don't know, it just makes me feel good when I see things like that. <laughs> We've got um, a lot more focus now on driving root mass with our stimulants and everything else. I believe we're being able to put a lot more carbon into our system by growing more roots. So we're not growing it all on the surface to oxidise off later on as it's breaking down. We're growing more matter under the soil which can then feed everything and cycle that way and stay in the soil. So that's just a picture of one of my wheat and vetch, I believe. So uh, that one would have been some oats. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty happy. I think that's the right thing to be doing. It's working. <laughs> um, yeah, just some other photos around fungi, um, plants, sunflowers. Love sunflowers. They seem to just do something magic. And most of the time when you pull one out of the ground, it just looks like that. And I know it was talked about the other day about how much more mycorrhizae they seem to bring into the system. Um, so I think that just shows it can do a lot of positive things. Uh, this soil here, this was um, dug up by hand walked out into a barley crop the other day and just down on the inter-row just being able to grab that soil and just pull it out by hand and see all the root activity, uh, the soil structure and a bit of fungi going on. Uh, it's actually a worm or two up in the top corner. It just shows me how things are really evolving and just working. And you sort of go out into the neighbours where they're a tine and press wheel system and they just doesn't have that interaction on the inter-row. It's just hard and dry when it's not raining. Um, so I think what I'm up to, things are really changing and it's, it's something positive's happening. I uh, got my hands on one of these a while ago, which was pretty exciting to see what was happening down below, if we can play that video. Oh, yeah, a button. It's quite a hard thing to do, to push one of them in and video at the same time, I've worked out. But no, we're getting quite a soft soils now and not quite break, just getting over 200 right at the bottom. So I was pretty happy with that. And when I do a comparison and jump over the fence, I had to have two hands on it to push it in. So it was quite hard to video and push it in at the same time. But it shows me we're getting a lot of carbon going in at depth. We're getting water to go in. And to me, things are working positively. We're opening our soils up. It's, there's no hard. There's no hard pans in there anywhere to hold the roots up, so they are going down. So it's very good. There's a, uh, it's a bit of an average photo in a paddock. It was just showing, it was 
roughly averaging around about that 250 pound push. And when we went over to our wheel track, it will up to yeah, 550. So um, just showed the importance of our CTF at home and how well it was working by controlling that, that footprint. So I uh, took this photo a couple of years ago. Uh, it's over the neighbour's fence. Mine's on the left, his is on the right. He was a few years into his zero till journey and I think that might have been 14 years in or something me. And it was really good just to see the difference in aggregation and a little bit more fungi going on at mine and it was really good to see he had a little bit of structure starting to come in there too and a little bit of activity as well in his soil. So it was just a real good eye opener to see where we've sort of come from in that in that term that a few years in so because I never did pay a lot of attention into soils and how much they changed in our early days it was just something that wasn't on my radar at all so uh, when we are using urea or broadcasting urea on the paddocks which we've done a little bit this year due to a very wet very wet cold season um, I'm mixing it in with a carbon source we're using so it gets mixed up the auger which is a little video here because um, a lot of people do ask how to, what's the best way to mix it and when but I'm actually mixing it out of the truck and straight into the spreader because a few years ago I did take notice that when I treated it before I put it in a truck going from a truck to a truck the trucks actually unloaded funny on one side or if I put it in a bin sort of got held up in a bin so I now do it into a spreader which dries pretty quick and runs out of the spreader beautifully. That little interaction of bouncing around seems to keep shaking it in. So I just find that's the easiest thing for me. Um, nothing worse than putting a truck up and finding out it's only run down one side and it's blowing a gale. So that's just, just a safety thing for me, that. Yep. Um, this year, when I have top dressed, it's only been a low rate. We've only put out 50 kilos as I'm a little bit mindful of that interaction with the urea, burning up a bit of carbon and setting my system backwards a bit. It's not something I do every year, but I believe in our system being more biologically focused. We do need a bit of N at the start and a bit of punch through that winter period because our biology does go to sleep and we just need that help through the winter period, keep the energy in the plant. So, so it's gone out at a low rate and then we'll pick it up now with foliars that are going out at the moment. So, um, sure which one this is. Uh, that's just a photo of some companions. I do a lot of companion mixes now. I don't tend to grow monocultures much anymore. Um, I'll try and get a legume in with everything and a tillage radish in with all my cereals, especially the ones that I can sow pre the start of May. Because at home I've found that if you're sowing it after May, we don't get the real benefit of them. Everything's just too slow. And when we're spraying them out in August, they just haven't done their work. So I try to pick longer varieties now to be in before May so I can get the benefit out of these. Um, I'm taking it back to, to a monoculture purely because of harvest logistics. I don't want to deal with trying to grade Fetch out of wheat and barley and oats. Um, yeah, well, that might actually be a video. Is it? No, no. Anyway, um, that's just a photo there of barley this year. It's a constant cereal rotation, this block. Um, it's healthy. There's something going on with what we're doing. We haven't put a lot of nutrition into that and hasn't been over it for a long time. It just seems to work and I don't really have the words to explain some of the things there, but um, <laughs> but I don't know, there's just something about having a legume and a cereal side by side that just the sharing, sharing ability, I believe, of the two plants and the way the biology is interacting under the soil. I think there's just something magic there. 
and with that photo around the nodulation and the cereal roots there, it's just sharing, I believe, and we're getting a lot of our nitrogen and phosphorus this way, I believe, and a lot of other nutrition. Uh, when it's all sprayed out, the crop generally fills in and looks pretty happy at the other end. Uh, taken, moved into some intercropping. Um, most of my canola now has vetch with it or beans, uh, which is taken through to harvest and separated afterwards. Um, an end hungry crop like canola, I'm trying not to give it a lot of end, so I'm trying to give it its end this way. And just being more mindful on how my soils will respond in the subsequent years and the following crops. So that photo at the moment was where I felt it was pretty balanced the other day. But in that paddock with the season we're having at the moment, the canola struggled in a few areas with wet feet, but the vetch has actually taken off. So it's going to be more of a vetch crop there and less canola and other spots there's more canola and less vetch. So to me that's I'm still pulling something off each area of that paddock now. So and at the end of the day this year, both commodities are pretty similar in value, so which is pretty good too. Ah, it's just another photo of how that is. It's just the vetch is just running up through it all. Uh, beans, trying to move away from a bean monoculture. So we're going into beans and lupins together as an intercrop on alternate rows trying to minimise the disease in the beans. Um, in our granite soils, we seem to have a bit of a subsoil acidity where the beans have struggled up on the rises to grow, nodulate, and basically give me some residual end moving forward. So our lupins have always done well. So I've just put them together so that way up on the rises, we're actually still got a fair bit of end going in for subsequent crops. And being two different seed sizes, they'll be quite easy to separate after harvest. Um, oh, this is that video I was looking for before. Um, yeah, back on the barley. That's just barley on barley. And it was just a little spot I found the other day when I had the pitchfork in with a mate. And I was just taking a video and found a nice spot, a bit of fungi happening and all the residue underneath it all. And... To me, he was quite taken back by how actually healthy the barley was for being barley on barley stubble. There was just not a lot of disease in it. So he thought it would have been belted pretty hard. A lot of that stubble there on that inner road generally is gone by the end of the year. It... Um, to me, it served its purpose in protecting that ground and everything right through till when the next crop's ready to be harvested. So, yeah. Move forward. Ah, uh, so basically, I thought I'd better take a photo of some soil. Um, that's where we are now, digging in a paddock. Uh, that's some soil of mine, and then straight over the fence, straight into my uncle's farm, which was basically farmed the same way we were before we went down zero till. And that's purely, I look at that now and say, well, that's more or less where I've come from, and that's pretty much where I am now. So to me, everything I'm doing is making sense and working. I'm getting good aggregation. I'm putting in carbon, I know, just by looking at that shovel because I just don't have that red, that red bit at the bottom of the shovel full. It's getting a lot darker, my A horizon's growing, and baselining around carbon projects is something I haven't done, probably should one day, a lot of pressure there. But it's just something I feel I'm not ready for, and I don't know that my farming system's ready to sell my carbon I'm sequestering. I still would like to know that I've got my carbon there because I want to use it in my crops. Because um, the day might come where my crop's going to take it out for me or I don't know what's around the corner. I might have to do something and burn a bit up. I just I get a bit nervous about the way the projects are going. So 
It's just my opinion that. I'd just like to see a little bit more work around them and a bit more legislation so they're constant. There's some more... can't even get the right word there. But anyway. Um, that was after a rain event this year at Sewing. That's mine on the left and some of the neighbours on the right. So traffic ability, water infiltration, it was just... It shows me that what we're up to is working well. We can drive on our country after a big rain event. It just goes in, gets locked away. Um, and I know the neighbours struggle because it's just all mush on top. It just sits there for days. So, yeah. Um, harvest. Yep, stripper front. Chase the bin. Uh, try and leave, yep, good amounts of residue. It just protects it through till the next sowing season. I haven't gone into growing summer covers. I'm a big believer, because I'm in a cropping system, I want to leave my straw standing to protect it from the sun, the wind, and retain that moisture. I know it can get wet now, but I just don't know if it's going to be dry come April and I don't get to establish my crop. So um, it's something I've got to look into, I think, in the future to use that moisture we have now because we do have a lot of carryover moisture these last couple of years at home and it's something I'm thinking about how to address it moving forward, whether it is just a short-term crop just to use up some water. Um, yeah, canola and vetch, it seems to make a pretty simple sample. It's been quite easy to separate, two different seed sizes. Canola and beans, so not a bad sample, easy to separate. And grain bags, we put all our stuff in grain bags. Um, it just seems to work, we just like to keep the header moving. And canola comes out of a grain bag really nice. We've left it in the bag for 12 months, it hasn't been an issue. It just works. Uh, lifting the bags up this year, we are noticing a lot of fungal activity, just anything away from the sunlight, we just seem to find a lot of, a lot of decomposers and stuff going on. So it's just been, just been something I've been getting excited about and to see that out in the paddock as well when you open some stubble up, it's, it's been good. Uh, something I'm looking at now is some biological testing, just seeing what we have in our soil and making sure I actually have the right populations of the right things. So by moving away from soluble phosphorus, I need to know, have I got soluble, sol phosphorus solubilizers there and have I got enough of them to give me crop the nutrition it needs. So I'm still trying to make a lot of sense out of this. And it's just, I thought I'll put a slide up from some of the things that are coming back from this. This has all been done through Metagen in Brisbane and I'm still working with him to understand a lot of it, but purely I wanted to see how the, the AMF numbers were over a couple of different rotations. So the biggest one I didn't probably put in there um, was what the VAM numbers did after canola. They were actually back at about 20. So the canola did knock them around and that was even taken out of a canola and bean crop. So having the beans in there to try and promote that VAM across that canola crop, it still didn't, still didn't hold it up. So just gonna do a bit more work around that. But, but this, this one here came off uh, third year cereal. So there was a few issues in that end of the paddock, which is a really coarse sandy part of the paddock, which I'm trying to work out what was happening there. Yep. And that was just another part of the sample. Yep. Um, so I just want to finish there with a few things before I summarise at the end. It's sometimes when the wheels come off at home. Um, <laughs> bad axle. I'll uh, play that one. And when the wheels come off and things come apart, which I couldn't get this one in a photo, it was one of those days. <laughs> it... Uh, <laughs> it 
that, um, yeah, there's not much you can do, really. <laughs> but, um, no, when things are going, whoop, things go bad. We have things go bad, too. And um, things break, but you can fix them. But there's always something good that happens somewhere. And I love going back and looking at nice photos of crop, um, some barley. But with the barley, it's just something, as an observation, we're not punching a lot of any into our crops at the start of the year, so we're not growing a lot of biomass. We're still growing tillers, and when it gets to this stage, all of a sudden it just becomes a big sea of grain on top, which it's just something to really see. And you sort of open it up, and there's not a lot of leaf area underneath it, but there's just a big mass of grain on top. And I don't know, it just works. It just far out yields the way it looks when it's uh, elongating up. So, um, that one, just nice photo I took. We just live straight over that hill. Well, that, this side of the hill is actually the start of our place. And lovely end result. Um, those things happen, obviously. But um, another thing that goes bad, we find a lot of farmers tend to be fairly innovative in what they can do and come up with to fix a problem. Uh, it's the fuel tank out of the head of last year. Um, had a little static fire, burnt the top out. Um, then they told me there were no parts due to COVID. They were going to turn up in February. So went home, got the young blokes 3D printer, made a few fittings, cut the side out of a shuttle, fabricated the piece up the side of the air cleaner we needed, um, straight into Bunnings, bit of ducted tubing, and 280 hours later, still on the header, worked well. Um, pattern is still pending. <laughs> but uh, we're glad to see the, all the parts did turn up in March, so quite glad I didn't sit and wait for that. So no, we, I find yeah, people will overcome a problem as best they can. So, uh, just a cool photo of just some soil, <laughs> summer, just dry aggregations. Uh, canola in straw, um, the other day, it just doing a foliar pass, it just, I just really love it, it just seems to work. Uh, often get random things like that emerging, <laughs> growing out from under a bag, but um, yeah. Find a bit of trash flow every now and then on the cedar. Um, doesn't damage anything, but get to pick it up and move it. Um, just another cool thing I'll come across one day. Uh, another nice patch of wheat. Uh, just a shovel I took. I think that was back in 2015. I was just really happy in the summer just seeing just a bit of fungi on some soil there after a rain and just showed me just a bit of temperature and things just really got going. Uh, another photo out of our soil pit back in 18. Just got a lot of dark lines going down our profile there where old roots have been and decomposed and all the new roots just continually keep following them. And it's just something I'd really love to do again soon is dig another pit and see what's changing, are we getting any more, more root activity depth, which I think we will be. Uh, the side of my urea tank at home where I dissolve urea, that was actually 11 o'clock in the morning. Still covered in ice. Yep. Uh, a few random radishes. Uh, some canola and beans. We do windrow all our beans, canola, lupins, just purely for harvest logistics. Um, that way they're ready to be, we can go and harvest them whenever it suits us and not when it suits the crop. So um, this is something we've done for a long time. Uh, photo of vetch and canola. And I always like to have a photo of sunflowers. They do look good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's about that. But I was gonna summarize a few points at the end. Probably didn't go into it. I knew it'll go over my head, but... Um, Bear with me a second. 
Sometimes things don't work at home. I've, I've learned a few lessons over the few years. Um, I did do a lot of travelling, go around looking at people's places, trying to understand what's going to happen when I did implement it at home. So I always felt I was prepared for when things wouldn't quite go to plan, but I know my business partner, my father, um, probably never got him quite prepared as well when we changed things. So he's enjoying learning what we're doing now, but some of the things have been quite a shock with him, like when we dropped MAP and replaced it with soft rock phosphate, just the lack of energy at the start. So, but things at the moment are going all right and he's enjoying learning and watching, but it's being prepared for what happens and things are working pretty well across most of the farm, but there is still portions of our farm that's not quite happening and they're the bits I enjoy working with to try and get right. And every year there's something different going there and we are a business, we still have to make money to pay the bills and I think if you're going to do something drastic, really research it and try not to do it. Just go slowly. Um, just transition slowly from things because things do, do seem to happen at a slow pace. But um, I'm trying to say here, I am putting an odd fungicide on at the moment, even though I haven't used them for a very long time. But it is purely because I still have to grow a crop there. And... On those microbial analysis, I did. I didn't put it on, and I showed that it did knock it around, but it didn't knock it around detrimentally. So it gave me the confidence this year to move forward with a fungicide if I needed to, um, but choosing the right one, I think, still. And because we're not doing it every year in every paddock, I think we're getting a lot more numbers with all our fungi and bacteria going, so we can absorb one hit every now and then. So it helps to keep our business going. So I just wanted to say that. And understanding our environment, um, I won't put a tined implement in our ground, purely because we have a lot of quartz rises and a lot of shale rises. So we've taken 15 years to push all those stones back in the ground with the disc seeder, and I certainly don't want to bring them back up. I believe with our soil structures we have now, I can find a way to get a micronized, something micronized, whether it be lime or gypsum, into the profile quite easily through the aggregation we have now. So, or injecting it liquid that way. So, that's just my opinion on that. I just won't be jumping into work something again. And I'm not sure if I'm going to destroy all my structure. Is it going to bounce back? I don't know. But just the stones are the one thing I don't want to bring back. Yep. So that's why I'm that way with the tillage. Yep. So, yep. Uh, what else we got there? Um, for some reason, all the little aspects I do, it just, putting it all together, I think the whole system works. It's just not one component. There's just a whole lot of moving parts there. And putting a lot of attention and a lot of observation into it it's just making sure it all goes together and works. I don't know, I just pay a lot of attention to a lot of little things and I think that's why some things seem to work well at my place that don't seem to work anywhere else. And I do a lot of sap analysis and I didn't go into that because we can go for a week. But I do a lot of things I haven't shown there or talked but I just wanted to go into purely about soils and structures and I don't know. If I got it right or not, but it's, I can just see at home by looking all the time that our structures are changed, our soils are getting darker, and we're getting a lot more biological activity. So definitely go and travel, go and see someone, because when you stand in the paddock with the grower, there's no lies, and you can see it and touch it, smell, feel yourself. And that's one thing I enjoyed doing was travelling around and looking at other people's places. So. Pretty much me.